the show that reveals how extraordinary items in our world are designed, constructed and produced. See the engineering, the technology and big ideas that make the world go round. Find out how it works. Coming up, it's not so much Billy Goat rough as Billy Goat soft. We'll show you where Kashmir, one of the most luxurious wools in the world, comes from. Dental care has gone high tech. We'll take a look at the crown replacements made out of the same material as heat shields on the space shuttle. And we'll show you the incredible way nuts and chocolate are combined to make one of the world's most popular breakfast spreads. But first, if you find yourself behind the wheels of one of these beauties, well, lucky you. But the people at Jaguar don't recommend you store it for years in a chicken shed without washing it. However, if that's what you've done and you've now got a rusty wreck on your hands, you can always employ the help of a vintage car restorer. When they were first made, a beauty like this cost £6,000. Putting it back together will cost far more, but restoration is for love, not money. Jaguars are British, but one of the world's leading experts in restoring them is based in Germany. Our rusting piece of British motoring history starts her journey back to health with a shower. Once she's been cleaned, the engineers can assess the work ahead. Although a lady never reveals her age, this beauty was built in 1975, so it's likely there's a lot to be done. Anything beyond repair can be rebuilt, but it's general practice to try and restore the original engine. Rusted metal, on the other hand, must go. Rustproofing in the late 70s wasn't very good, and large sections of this car are quite literally crumbling. The engineers have to work out what they can save and use it as the basis to rebuild the body. The lady also receives a full coat of rustproof paint to try and stop the same problems from reoccurring. With the structure being restored, the engineers can turn to the lady's looks. Having reached the ripe old age of 32, it's going to take a lot more than a facelift to restore her charms. The entire car is stripped so that any problems or defects can be ironed out. The aim of restoration is to give a car its fresh off the production line look once more, so everything must be perfect. With only bare metal showing, the painter primes the structure with a white undercoat, ready for her new colours. And the only colour that would do, of course, is British Racing Green. The engineers use a machine which has records of every car colour ever used. It tells them exactly which shades to add to create everything from Chevy Red to that famous green. The fresh coat is airbrushed into place by painters in full protective clothing. When she's fully dressed once more, she'll take a quick trip to the oven. One hour at 70 degrees Celsius dries the lacquer to a hard, protective shell. Meanwhile, in an entirely different part of the garage, an expert seamstress is reupholstering the seats. The original leatherwork needs replacing, so she fashions new seats and uses the original covers to cut them down to the right size. Wire ribbing is used to strengthen them, but it's very cleverly sewn in underneath so as not to hurt the passenger's delicate seating. Finally, the covers are reattached to the original framework and stapled into place. Depending on the amount of work and the type of car, restoration can take years. Often there are parts to find or completely build from scratch to restore a classic like this, particularly the engine. However, owing to the combination of quality English workmanship and modern German technology, this classic 4.2-litre V6 engine has been given a new lease of life. It weighs over 350 kilos, so the engineers hoist it into position. 
They'll then carefully lower it onto its original mounts and screw it into place. An army of engineers then tightens everything to ensure nothing wobbles when she's started up again. With the engine coming along nicely, the interior also gets some attention. New carpets are being laid down in that traditional 70s colour, dark chocolate brown. And to put this sparkle back into her eyes, all the chrome gets replated. First, the old chrome is removed. A bath in sulfuric acid strips away the old pitted metal, revealing copper underneath. That's then sanded down to reveal the base layer, which is brass. This shines beautifully but tarnishes easily, which is where the chrome comes in. Several different layers are now applied to protect the metal and restore her shine. Copper for rust proofing, nickel for a silvery foundation, and finally chrome to bring back that stunning finish. All the pieces are coming together. With the interior completed, the new seats can now be fitted. Then it's time for the new roof covering. Unlike modern cars, this old Jaguar had a vinyl roof. A luxurious leather covering wouldn't stand a chance against the English rain. Next, the freshly chromed metalwork is refitted. The engineers have to be particularly careful at this point because if there's even the tiniest of scratches to the fresh bodywork, they would have to start all over again. Now, a classic wouldn't be right without all the elements in place, including the badges, light fittings and all the original ornaments. For the classic restorer, these parts are expensive and very hard to find. You can't just pop onto eBay for spares. However, if the restorer is lucky, the manufacturer may have used similar fittings on a range of vehicles. This improves the chance of finding replacement parts. Once he's sure everything's in place, he checks the oil, gives her a quick polish and sits back to admire his handiwork. The previous owner clearly had no idea what kind of treasure he had hidden in his barn. Although the investment to restore her far exceeds the price that he could get, restorers everywhere would agree that this is one lady who should never have been left on the shelf. False teeth may once have been made from wood, but today dentists are using the same material they use to make heat shields for the space shuttle. Traditional crowns were made of metal covered in a white ceramic, but this covering can wear away, revealing the metal inside. However, zirconium oxide offers a metal-free alternative. It's immensely powerful stuff and has been used to make heat shields for the space shuttle. The first thing the dentist has to do is anesthetize the patient. He'll then attach a device that looks like something out of an astronaut training program. It measures the angle of the patient's bite. If you're afraid of dentists, look away now. Using that high-powered saw they all seem to love so much, he cuts through the old crown to remove it. The metal peg beneath needs to come out as well. Then, to fit the new crown, the old spaces have to be prepared. You wouldn't have seen this before, unless you were a dentist, of course, but using a UV light-sensitive paste, he builds up new anchor points. The next stage is quite high-tech, but it's only a cosmetic process. Using a laser, the dentist will cut away excessive gum flesh to balance out the teeth. The laser cauterizes the flesh so there's no risk of bleeding or infection, and it even comes with its own little hoover to suck up all the spare bits. Now the dentist can make the new crowns. First, a plaster cast is taken of the teeth. 
This will help the dentist fashion the new crown so they fit perfectly. And because no one likes to look like they're wearing false teeth, the dentist also checks the colour of the real teeth. This is so the new ones match. The patient will then be fitted with some temporary implants until our new crowns are ready. The mould is filled with plaster to create a realistic model of the teeth and the gaps that must be filled. When it's dried, the two sides are tested once again to line up the new crowns. Tiny adjustments are the difference between uncomfortable dentures and the perfect bite. With the plaster cast in place, it's now time to make each crown. The dentist uses wax because it's easiest to manipulate. In many ways, this kind of work is more like sculpture than dentistry. She'll use different shades of wax to create a model that looks as close as possible to a tooth. This makes it easier for her to see what she's doing. Next, the sculptor will fit it to this machine, which is the heart of the process. Taking a zirconium oxide blank, she'll fit the model to one side and the blank to the other. First, the machine will scan the model. This tells the drill on the other side where and how to cut the blank down. Like tooth enamel, zirconium oxide will resist the bacteria in saliva, but again, like tooth enamel, the drill can cut through it easily. The next stage is the oven. At 1350 degrees Celsius, it hardens the crown, but it also shrinks it by about 30%. The dentist knew this was going to happen, so what emerges should fit perfectly onto the model. With the crown completed, you would think that that would be it. But if you put that brilliant white replacement into the patient's mouth, it wouldn't look natural. It's time to add the colour so it will match her other teeth. It may look like the dentist is having a laugh using pink and blue paint, but this is because of the heating process. When these two pigments are combined and then cooked, they take on a toothy colour. So, using the plaster cast model, the dentist has worked out the spaces for the new crowns, created wax models and then made new teeth using ceramics and her paint box. All that remains now is for the patient to try them out. The crowns are firmly attached and tested for that perfect bite. And of course, the final test is the mirror. Ideally, the patient shouldn't be able to see any difference between her high-tech crowns and her own teeth. So, although these crowns will never see the stars, they'll certainly help her nibble on a bar of galaxy. Still to come, only certain regions of the world are suitable to raise the goats that produce the silky soft bounty of cashmere wool. And you may not know it, but this nutty chocolate spread is more popular than peanut butter. We'll show you how it's produced. Kashmir is considered to be one of the softest and most comfortable wools that can be used for clothing. But it's also one of the most expensive. And here's why. Kashmir doesn't come from sheep like you might expect, it comes from goats. Yes, goats, those smelly, coarse-haired cousins of sheep that like hanging around remote hillsides. The secret to a really good crop of Kashmir is the goat's undercoat. They only produce this downy underhair in certain parts of the world where the climatic conditions are cold enough to encourage its growth. Like Eiderdown from ducks, this hair is produced to insulate the goat. But what makes it so special is its structure. The overcoat is made up of thick, coarse hair. Seen up close under a microscope, it would appear quite jagged and rough. This is the complete opposite of the undercoat, which is far smoother. It's what gives cashmere its soft texture and makes it so much more comfortable against the skin. 
It isn't easy collecting the wool because the goats really don't like having their hair pulled. But once the crop has been collected, it's sent off to the local mill to be turned into cloth. Nope, this isn't the latest way to wear cashmere. These workers are experts and know what to do with the fresh wool. First, it needs to be blended. Every goat's wool is a different shade. So by mixing them together, the factory gets an even color throughout the batch. It then takes a bit of a journey through this old machine. This process is known as carding. Combs brush the wool so that it all runs in a similar direction and the separate strands bind into a big felt-like cloth. The sheet of wool that emerges from the far end of this row of rollers is taken down to the next stage of the process to be spun into thread. In this form, the thread is very soft to the touch, but it's also very weak. It needs to be spun again. This last stage strengthens the fiber, and one kilo of wool can now produce over 6,000 meters of cashmere thread. The UK can only boast around 50 cashmere producers, with a total of about 2,500 goats in all. Most of the cashmere used in the UK for clothing production is imported. Like the old cloth mills of the Industrial Revolution, the cashmere is woven on a loom. Experienced hands load up the shuttles with fresh wool, ready to start the knitting process. And although it is an old machine, it's faster than the human eye can follow. This kind of loom is a very old design, but very effective for weaving cloth. A high-speed shuttle, which was pre-loaded with wool, is passed very quickly back and forth between two rows of threads. The thread from the shuttle works like a scaffolding structure to bind the other threads around. It takes the wool from three goats and four hours on one of these machines to weave a scarf. But if you want to make a sweater, you'll need the wool from about six goats. The only thing that remains for the traditional cashmere scarf is the loose tassels at the ends. This is something the machines can't do, but there are plenty of spare hands to help tie knots and give the scarves their famous look. So the next time you wrap that soft cashmere scarf round your neck, spare a thought for the softer side of the old billy goat gruff. We all know chocolate is delicious, but whoever came up with the idea of spreading chocolate onto bread was a genius. But how do you get cocoa beans and hazelnuts to stay on your toast? To make this popular nutty chocolate spread, first we need cocoa. The raw beans grow on trees in countries like the Ivory Coast, where workers have to toil in extreme temperatures to harvest them. They're spread out to dry in the tropical sun, and after 10 days, they're perfect. They're then bagged up and transported round the world to places like this chocolate spread factory here in Europe. They're now headed for the roasting ovens. The beans are almost 50% cocoa butter and roasting reduces them to a liquid paste. However, this butter solidifies at room temperature and you'd never be able to spread it on your toast, so it needs to be removed. To do this, the paste is sent to these enormous presses which squeeze every last drop of butter out. The liquid butter is sent on to be used in other products, but what emerges from the machine is a chocolate lover's idea of heaven. Each disc weighs 7 kilos. They look like big blocks of makeup, but in fact they are pure compressed cocoa. They're sent off to be crushed, ready to be added to the mixing bowl. Next come hazelnuts, and plenty of them. The traditional recipe for a spread like this means there's the equivalent of about 50 nuts in each jar. 
Before they're allowed in, the quality controller uses his special guillotine to chop a sample in half. Worms can get into the nuts or they can go off, and that would ruin the spread. When he's satisfied that he's got good nuts, they're sent to be processed. They need to be cleaned and roasted before they can join the chocolate, so they all head for the ovens. It's important that each jar of spread looks and tastes the same, so any poor quality nuts are sorted out and then sent off to be used in other recipes. A computer-controlled blast of air flicks out the bad nuts, leaving only the best behind. They're joined by the pure cocoa powder, sugar, vanilla and skimmed milk in an enormous tank. Here they're mixed into the smooth paste that so many people love. The factory has now got enormous tanks of spread, but to get it to your table, they also need jars. Using recycled glass, these enormous furnaces produce tons of containers every day. Chocolate spread is so popular that worldwide sales of the brand leader outsell all brands of peanut butter put together. The furnaces have a lot of work to do to keep up with demand. Once it's ready, the molten glass is then sent to a machine which wouldn't seem out of place in a Hollywood sci-fi movie. This is the jar maker. Each blob of molten glass is shot into one of these molds. Here, they're pressed into the shape of the jar. The next machine ensures that the screw thread for the lid is included, and that's it. To make sure there are no imperfections, the fresh jars pass under a series of flames. This seals any small holes there might be in the glass. They're then cooled with a quick blast of water and get sent to a room where they'll sit for two days at 30 degrees Celsius. If you were to put hot spread into cold glass jars, you'd get condensation and moisture. No one wants that. When the jars are ready, they're passed under these pipes and filled to the brim. All that remains now is to seal them up. Here, lids are being sorted. They only work if they're the right way up, and this ingenious machine only uses ones that are facing the right way around already. The rest have to try again. Within each lid is an airtight seal, but how does that attach to a new jar of spread? As a full jar passes beneath this machine, it pastes a layer of glue onto the rim. When the lids are added, this glue traps the seal and the job is complete. So if you're a confirmed chocolate nut, put down that marmalade and grab yourself a jar of world-famous nutty chocolate spread.